Welcome to the Murphy's Law edition of Rates and Barrels. It is Thursday, June 6th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We dig into some pitcher performances that have shifted from the first month of the season to the second month of the season. Sort of the companion episode to what we did on Tuesday. We did the same exercise for hitters. We'll talk about some stuff risers, stuff fallers, like overall performance, and compare some of the original projections for this season to result so far try to figure out why some players are so far above or below expectations we're also going to have a round of project prospect later on in the show and our weekend waiver preview so we're going right into the content because frankly ha, the details of my life are not worth recounting on the podcast this morning i don't <laughs> want amazing twice. right now he, you know had a little heat stroke yesterday yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah just bad lead up to the show as far as uh life things <laughs> everything's good that's all i'll say about it but it was a rough morning let's begin with the pitcher performances and we're looking specifically at stuff risers as we begin and this connects to this loose idea that i floated on the show this week you know where i feel like to trade for pitching you almost have to anticipate who the stuff risers are going to be. And you have to know what can a pitcher do to get better in the model? What can they do to make their stuff more effective? Lower S stuff, right? Just how can they get better? And even within that, you have to think like, how much does a player fluctuate from month to month anyway? Just a, a guy with a t- typical three or four pitch arsenal that he generally commands really well there's going to be some up and down in that just as there is in the performance of a very good hitter we used freddie freeman as our example of a hitter that will have some up and down months and his low points are still like 110 wrc plus months yeah. but still even that i think gives us the sense that we don't get the kind of consistency even on a granular level that we really want from players yeah i think pitchers are a little bit more uh subject to the schedule, not only the opponents, the team opponents, because hitters have that, but hitters see a different pitcher or pitchers every night. So if you think like, yes, we did do a piece where we looked at like, oh, some of these hitters have randomly seen the best stuff in the big leagues and that that can happen. But generally, I think it evens out like strength of competition evens out a little bit more for a hitter because they just see so many more pitchers. Whereas a pitcher comes in every five days and like especially a starting pitcher comes in every five days and sees one team, mm-hmm. you know, and just over and over that one team. And then they nothing for four days, you know. So if they're in Colorado or if they're going to Cincinnati, you know, I, I, I sometimes I get. I've I've gotten like responses for people like, oh, what about this pitcher? He's in the tank. And I'm like, yeah, he just did Cincinnati and Colorado. Right. And that may have followed a couple other difficult stretches or it could have been extra travel around that. It's that combination of factors that is really hard to to see on the micro level. And it's even you can try to predict and project the schedule, but with off days, guys. Like with Keaton Wynn. Yeah. We kind of did. We did a good job there because we were like, "Hey, these next few starts are no good. Like, if you need to move on, move on." Like, anybody who listened to that advice probably profited. But I would say now, you know, I just bought Keaton Win for a dollar in main event. Like, you, like now is the time to maybe buy buy it back in. Uh, by the time he's back and healthy and back in the big leagues, it should be soon. It is strange. There's a pretty decent sized chunk of the player pool that is important to our game, but isn't necessarily glued to rosters. That is, yeah, and, and analyzing and managing that pool of players correctly is actually really important. It's a way to kind of separate yourself a bit from the pack. Yeah, I mean, that's I think that my big revelation in that was last year when we were like 790th out of 810 main event teams, and we still managed to place in our league at the end of the season just by like you know, you know, sheer gumption and, and, and elbow, <laughs> elbow grease, you know? So like, you know, you can effort your way up the standard standings and most of it has to do with schedule, but also like just little things where you're like, Oh, this guy's hurt for a while. So this other player is going to actually play a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, the kind of thing where it's like Corey jokes may not be the greatest player, but two weeks ago we told y'all that he was playing a lot and that, Chicago is going to play him. And now all of a sudden he's the leadoff hitter in Chicago and like his numbers look okay. You know, so it's like identifying changes in 
lineups, changes in team philosophies, you know, that will come soon and we'll do a, we'll do a, a pod on it, of course, but there will come soon a point at which players are traded from teams and all of a sudden some guy on the, on the team behind him uh, gets a chance. All of a sudden Addison Barger is the everyday third baseman in uh in toronto because they've decided to trade away vladdy you know so it's like um you know that that kind of stuff staying on top of it can really make a difference and it's a little bit less obvious with hitters but it's there with hitters it's really obvious with pitchers where you're like there's just a grouping of 30 to 40 pitchers that is just not good enough it's good enough to pitch in good matchups and it's just not good enough to pitch in bad matchups I've been spending time out in the yard a lot, and I've been working on the Trade Maker 3000. We're going to fire up the Trade Maker 3000 a few times between now and the deadline. It's a great machine. Um, I, I think you just said if the Blue Jays trade Vlad Jr., and I heard the machine start whirring in the backyard. I was like, Whoa, <laughs> didn't know that was on the table. So uh, happy, happy machine rumbling away in the backyard. I uh, love Addison Barger as a random name poll there too. Just a just a great name. Addison Barger. <laughs> Sounds like he'd hit 30 home runs if you gave him 600 plate appearances uh, someday. Good. Yeah, it's definitely definitely something that could happen. Uh, as for the risers, April versus May in terms of stuff. This is a pretty interesting list that you pulled together because it includes some guys who were kind of average who got better. It includes some guys who are below average who got better and are still below average and it includes some guys who are good that got better, right? So you kind of have three different buckets that you can work with. Um, I find it interesting. Bailey Falter is in here as someone that jumped from a 77 stuff plus to a 92 in May. And I was thinking about the Pirates when you were talking about how the schedule can be kind of weird. If you catch the Pirates for a three-game series where you miss Skeens and Jared Jones, that's great for hitters. If you catch them when you see both, that is terrible for hitters. <laughs> It's a big swing. You may only see one. You may see both. You may not see any one of them. But it's because of guys like Falter in the back of the rotation that you're not worried about. You still look at that team as one that you're kind of hunting on the schedule to some degree. You're just trying to be very selective and careful about it. But uh, as far as the, the big risers over the last 30 days or so, what really caught your eye the most once you put this together? Well, I've just been fielding questions about Spencer Aragetti. He's number one on the list. And, um, you know, given his strikeout rate, the an eight, even an 89 stuff plus that he's had over the last 30, um, you know, kind of sticks out as is, is that is that correct? Um, and, you know, I think one thing um, that. Uh, there's been he's kind of improving his stuff in the two ways you can improve it. One is that uh, his 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 pitches are getting better. Like his his fastball is is harder now than when he first came in. He, his debut was 92. The next games were 93. Uh, he's been sort of round up to 94 for four uh, straight starts now. Uh, and he have he had a couple where he's round up to 95 almost. So um, you know the velo has been better. Um, you know, the, the ride's been better month by month. Uh, he's gotten more ride on his four seam, um, every month. Um, and you know, and then on the, the cutter, uh, the cutter has gotten, uh, more horizontal movement, um, as the season has progressed. The other thing that's interesting about Spencer Argetti though, is that we put cutters into stuff plus as fastballs. And I'm pretty sure that Spencer Aragetti's cutter is not a fastball. Hmm. I mean, first of all, he has a four seam. Um, and then second of all, his four seam is 94-ish and his cutter is 87-ish. And that's a pretty big difference in velo. Um, and so I'm I, we're one, one thing we're considering with Stuff Plus is uh, maybe making a conditional where it's like cutters that are within four miles an hour of the four seam are cut fastballs and cutters that are bigger gap are breaking balls. Um, you know, this, this may be something that gets shook out in the end um, eventually, but um, you know, his cutter still gives up a 375 slugging 232 batting average. Um, it, uh, it doesn't get a, a ton of whiffs, but it gets 15% whiffs. There's almost like slider ish whiffs. Um, so it's possible that his cutter is more of a, um, 
of a, a cutter, like a baby slider, mm. um, in which case we would be um, mis characterizing him uh, and uh, missing some of the, the goodness there. I mean, and then the last thing is like, uh, you know, the more that he strikes guys out, the further he gets into his uh, major league career, the less that stuff plus matters, you know, um, the, the more that actual results take over. We've got now from him. Um, let's see how many pitches has he thrown? Why don't that used to be, I'm getting used to the new pages on fan graphs. Where is the pitches? Anyway, I mean, he's got 46 innings. So at this point, you can start to look at K minus BB. 26% uh, strikeout rate, 12% walk rate, uh, just uh, around league average. So he should have slightly better days coming. Uh, that makes him interesting. Nick Vavetta is in your category of just good getting better. Better Sonny Gray, uh, just uh, I think just a few more breaking balls, uh, you know, like a lot of his um, best pitches are not his fastballs. Um, and so when you look at his pitch usage uh, over time uh, this year, what you'll see is that he's, uh, as the season has gone on, um, thrown more sliders, uh, even thrown more change-ups uh, and fewer sinkers. So I think that's uh, changed his his number a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Cooper Criswell always stands out to me because I think he's just underrated by the fact that everyone looks at his, uh, his fastball velo. And, um, you know, this is a team that's devaluing the fastball anyway. And, uh, he's found a way to just basically what has his, uh, pitching coach said, just sort of jab with the fastball 29% sinker. 14% cutter, 27% slider, 29% changeup. Like, uh, he's pretty much just mixing it up. And uh, by K minus BB, he's starting to look good. Uh, it just doesn't, he's not going to give you plus plus strikeouts. But I think, you know, if you're careful with the schedule with him, uh, he's someone that you should keep on your roster during the weeks when you don't want to start him. Yeah, so I think there's, there's a gap here. Right? You want to look for, you want to look for players that maybe are getting dropped because it's a 12 team league. The schedule is tough. The ratios got blown up and that's what happened for Chris. Well, in May, even though the stuff got better, his ERA was actually bad. So people rostering him might just look at the surface numbers and say, okay, it's not working. It's a low velocity guy. ERA is over six, but the skills in his last five starts or his five starts in May. Anyway, it was 10 Ks per nine. It was a two and a half walks per nine, right? It, it looks pretty good by the analog metrics too. So yeah, Cooper Criswell is a, a great example of someone that would kind of be like another Keaton win where people will drop him, other people will pick him up, and the people that pick him up the second or third time might be the ones that actually roster him the longest and get the most mileage out of him mm -hmm. going forward. It's it's funny how that works. Brandon Fodd is, is also interesting that he has increased his stuff plus from 101 to 110. Um, I think that's mostly by uh, throwing a lot more sliders and not throwing the change up as much um, because his last 30 days pitch by pitch versus uh, April, um, you know, there's not really a standout number. The, the one thing he is doing too is he's throwing the curveball harder. What I want Brandon Fott to do, and this is so against lefties um, in his last start, he didn't throw the changeup. And I'm not sure how good the changeup is. And so I don't know if that was a matchup thing uh, that he didn't do it or that um, he just found something that works. He threw the sinker against lefties a lot more than he ever had in his last start. Um, but I want him to throw the curveball. The curveball is now like 81. And it registers as an above average pitch. And I think he should be four seam curve slider uh, with the occasional high sinker to lefties. So I, I think he's getting closer and closer to that, uh, that Clark Schmidt moment hmm. where he figures something out against lefties and, uh, and, and, and then sort of makes good on promise. What we've seen from Fott and uh and Clark Schmidt in the past are like good stuff plus numbers and poor results because of those splits and I think Fott might be closer than ever to figuring that out 
Yeah, it seems like this could be a little window where if you're trying to get pitching and you can't go to the top, we talked about some targets uh, earlier in the week. Maybe Brandon Fott is more gettable than other pitchers that will perform like him going forward. So that could be a, a good place to shop. And I don't think you and I have talked about Gavin Stone much at all this season. He also pops on this list. Results all year have been good. A sub-3 ERA, 119 whip. Um, K's haven't been there so far, but another guy where you look at the swing strike rate compared to the strikeout rate and say, there could be more strikeouts coming. At least you could tell yourself that story pretty easily when you look at the at the underlying numbers. Yeah, I just wrote him up, and there is a, a sort of burgeoning change with his fastball where he's had like two or three of the best fastball ride game uh, games of his career uh, in his last four or five starts, it hasn't stuck with him every game. So I don't know exactly what's happening. Maybe he's, he's trying to make some uh, um, adjustment that's regressing. I think that the floor that he's demonstrated so far is good enough that um, you can buy him. And you may have someone who's looking really hard at that 18% strikeout rate and saying, 18, 19% strikeout rate for his career, 17% strikeout rate for his career, a 494 ERA. And then projections like the one from the bat for a 460 ERA. And you may be able to get him from a savvy uh, owner that is focusing on the projections because I think, I think there's enough demonstrated here that he could beat it. He's works for, he, he works for a team. He works for a team that leads the league in BABIP allowed every year. And, um, you know, I, I, and he's got a fastball. It's improving and it's improving in both shape and gas. So, uh, it's not, um, it's not something you'll buy and he'll turn into an ace. I don't think, but he is a guy that did have, you know, 30% strikeout rates in the minor leagues and, uh, is showing a little bit under the hood. So he might be a, a kind of a, a cool under the, under the radar buy. Yeah, I don't think there's that much job security risk right now. I mean, we just saw James Paxton give a lot of ERA back done, against yeah. the Pirates. It just it looks like it's not working for Paxton. There's no to me, there's no obligation for the Dodgers to keep him in the rotation. They could make him a long reliever or they could, they could do a number of things with him or they could just go to a six man rotation once Bobby Miller's back because they do that at times. They don't always telegraph it. They just do it. So I think Gavin Stone is pretty safe right now, especially given the other injuries they've dealt with in that organization. A lot of the guys we thought would be coming back aren't necessarily coming back anytime soon. So yeah, Gavin Stone, definitely a name to circle. Going the other direction, we got a few fallers. I'm not surprised to see Jordan Hicks on this list because I think you mentioned it at least in the middle of May that things were already trending the wrong direction, but he's the biggest stuff plus faller from April to May. Hunter Green, Shota Imanaga, Luis Heal, Heal kind of being, and Green also being in the bucket of, we're very good in April and we're just pretty good or very good, but less so uh, in the last 30 days or so. Jared Jones also fits in that bucket too. Um, of the guys in here, I mean, are we looking at a threshold where we're saying, okay, this went from average to bad or from bad to worse? Like, who are you actually worried about among the bigger fallers that we saw from April to May? Uh, I mean, the, the, I'm going to just, I'm going to pick out the easy ones first. Um, you know, like Carlos Carrasco going down to an 85 and being injured, being his age. Um, Chris Paddock, uh, who you never trusted. To, never. To no. be <laughs> um, it was an easy avoid for me, but hey, like I got other stuff wrong, so don't worry. <laughs> the, the, the results. Uh, well, I mean, to your credit, you helped me uh, uh, push him down in my rankings every time I talk to you about it. Um, but he's down to an 84 stuff plus from 96. I think that some of the good stuff plus numbers were a mirage of short outings. Um, you know, so that one that one sticks out for me. Eric Fetty. You know, given how bad his fastballs uh, were uh, before and still kind of are. I mean, right now, um, let me see. For I'm going to just do the for the for the season. 59 stuff plus on the four seam, 82 on the sinker, 78 on the cutter. He is going to succeed by having three fastballs and mixing it up, but dropping down to 89 on a team that's not going to give him wins. Um, you know, that's something that I've got circled. Trevor Rogers going from an 89 to a 76. I mean, I've just, 
he's done for me as even somebody I want to pick up as a streamer. Mm. Um, you know, so those are those are the easy ones. The easy ones I don't care about are the ones you're talking about where they were they had great stuff and now they still have good stuff. And it's just the course of a season, I think. Jared Jones came in, you know, throwing one on ones every time, 136 stuff plus. Now he's down to 125, still the best in in baseball among starters, I think. So you know, that's I'm not worried about that. Hunter Green down to 115, not worried about that. Luis Hill 108. Not really worried about that, other than the general worry of um you know where what happens when the innings run out so the the real ones and then casey mize you know going from 114 to 102 you could say oh he's still 102 but given the rest of the stuff around it given the fact that so much of it's coming from his fastball getting worse i'm going to put him in the bucket of like maybe the deepest leagues I'm holding, but like 15 teamers are already moving on from Casey Mize. If there's somebody on the wire that has a better, um, that has a better matchup, Mitchell Parker dropping out 85, like those guys become more streamers and they'd have like Paddock would have to have the best matchup for me to, to be, to play him. Parker and Fetty might, might, there might be some matchups where I play them, but they become very much matchup plays that don't even have to stay on my roster. Um, I think the real toughest ones are ones that I just like, and I think they are pitching well and the K minus BB is still good. And I don't know how much to worry about it. And that there's a threesome there, Jose Soriano, Yoshinobu Yamato and Shota Imanaga. Those three are down big. And I don't know if I care. <laughs> that's completely fair i think what's going to happen in most cases is soriano would be cut because he's a little bit more like cooper chriswell in terms of newness to the roster uh, not at all in terms of stuff C- completely opposite picture as far as what he does with velocity but i could see people getting impatient with jose soriano because there's no track record there there wasn't a significant investment inexpensive via fab whereas both yamamoto and imanaga you're, you're talking about guys you expected big, big things from. So even if you see a run of a few bad starts, you're generally not panicking that much. You might just be more willing to trade them than you were a month ago. That would probably be the difference in what's actionable with them. Yeah, and Shota, like, you know, uh, the probable reason, there's one of the reasons I think that, that, I would be careful here. I'm not, this is not sourced reporting. I'm not saying that I know this, but one of the reasons that you could get a whole group of teams missing on a player like this and even get the contract that he got from the Cubs, the specific contract that he got, one of the reasons could be that there were some red flags in the medicals. Hmm. If you think about it, like think about what, the the, the 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 type of contract he got how it's like structured and the, the innings and all that stuff so that still exists he's still 30 you know with an inconsistent health track record and uh and now when i look at the numbers there is uh uh he, he is getting less ride as the season goes on um and uh and a little bit less velo as the season goes on and he's very much a two pitch pitcher right now so i feel like he may be a little bit more susceptible to these fluctuations in his fastball um i'm picking the nits to some extent but if (laughs) but if you're like if you're in a keeper league and you're out of it and you've got him it's worth wondering you might might be worth i mean especially if he has another good start you know let, let let the recency bias forget that last start you know uh it might be worth loading him and just seeing what you can get you might be able to get a really tasty bat and it might be worth it i mean you're still floating someone out there with a sub two era a near one whip over a strikeout per inning wins the ability to pitch deep into starts like there's a lot still going right overall mm-hmm. it's it's the tipping point of whoa, was this a top 10 starting pitcher that everybody missed on? Or did people just miss, did the market just miss slightly? I think yeah. it's looking more like the market missed slightly rather than by 
tens of millions of dollars, right? I mean, that that was an idea that was floated out there when he was just cruising in April. Got to give yeah. things time, you know? I mean, we And we knew from the Stuff Plus numbers in WBC that he had good shape on his fastball. That's still pretty much true. Uh, and that his splitter is good. And um, we also knew from his time in Japan that he's home run prone. So the fact that he's got a home run rate under one, um, you know, maybe the cold April like really helped him in that regard. And maybe, you know, there's going to be more like a one three or a one four homers per nine uh, the rest of the season. That's at least what the bat is saying. And the bat is still saying it. The bat is still saying he's a four two eight guy uh, with a homer and a half per inning. Um, so it's, you know, I don't know. It seems like consistently the bats run environment is a little bit higher. Yeah, um, it does. But um, it's still worth pointing out that the home run right there is uh, 1.5 for, for uh, Shota uh, on that projection. So I started looking back at the original projections for this season and just looking for the pitchers that have outperformed or underperformed by the widest margins. And I think this is one of the easiest ways to cast the net. Who, who should you move? Who's pitching really well? Who should you go for? Who's underperformed? If you dig in a little further and try and assess. And still why. like what you see or don't still, like it. Yeah, I still like what you see, right? This this at least, this tells you what lakes to fish in. Doesn't tell mm. you what bait to use. I don't think that's necessarily, I don't fish. If that, was, if that wasn't obvious, <laughs> made a point to, to clear that up right now. The biggest overperformers by ERA right now. So guys that were projected for four or five and are way below that for the most part. Not surprisingly, right? You're looking at you know, Nick Pavetta mm -hmm. uh, as someone that, or uh, you're looking at Tanner Houck, two and a half runs better than his projection so far through the end of May. Ranger Suarez, not a surprise. We talked about him a lot. Seth Lugo, three full runs better than his projection at the end of May. John Gray, more than two runs. Shota, we just talked about, uh, over two and a half runs. Luis Heal, over a two and a half run difference. And even Trevor Williams might be the biggest one of all. Three. 0.27 runs better, right? So the thing I start to do is put the skills indicators next to it. And I start to say, okay, well, like with Tanner Houck, we've talked about a handful of times, like what's what's changed with Tanner Houck through the first two months by results that would make this even remotely possible? K rate up slightly, you know, like, like a half K per nine or less, nothing wild. He has done a good job slashing his walk rate. He was projected to be over three walks per nine He's been under two. So you, you have to decide. Do you buy that skill as something that's legit? I kind of do. With the pitch mix change there. He turfed, turfed the, the bad four seam. Yeah, I think there's enough there to say, okay, he might not beat it by that much the rest of the way, but I think that's an improved skill where you can say that there's there's legit growth there. Uh, home run rate still microscopic. 0. 0.12 homers per nine this year. He may be the type that can, that can run small ones. Um, you wonder if maybe lefties at some point will figure something out. Uh, and that's, but that's before been last yeah. year, you know, I know it's sort of limited sample and a lot of those dudes were leaving, but he had like a 0.5 homers per nine for, from 2020 to 2022. So yeah, big ground ball rate too. So you could see him being an overperformer there and that being his true talent level. So the, the gap actually maybe shouldn't be as wide as people expect. Like his regression to the norm might be more of like a 350, 375 ERA the rest mm -hmm. of the way, which would still be a great outcome. If you drafted yeah. Hauk, you'd be really happy if he pitched that level the rest of the season. So I, I think that's sort of the the process by which you go through some of these names and, and try to figure out like what's real and what's not. And for Pavetta and Hauk, um, you know, there's a little bit of confirmation bias for me, at least, where I'm like, yeah, I thought these guys would be good going into the season, and they are. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on humming along. I don't quite have that with Seth Lugo, um, just because he was never really a stuff play as much as he was a guy that I thought um, I would start 75% of the time. Um, and I still. I guess I'm being less careful than that on the teams where I own him and pretty much starting him all the time. But I kind of want to remember that and remember that 
I wanted to treat him as a 75% guy. And that means he's more 40 to 50 in the rankings rather than, you know, 20 to 30, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, where, where he's at in terms of earned value, um, you know, to this point is much above where you'd put him rest of season. And, and then you can take like just straight up uh, like normal indicators and say the K minus BB at 16%, like league average is 14%. And I know his park is going to help him a little bit with the homers and maybe even the BABIP. And I guess uh, that defense behind him is, is that's, that's a good defense. So, um, you know, I think he, like in terms of home runs per nine and BABIP, it's probably not egregious uh, changes, but just based on how many balls he allows him to play, you'd think that there will be different days ahead. He's already had a couple bad starts. Um, I also just don't know. Sometimes you just have to just keep this guy. Cause like, th- don't you think a lot of people just see you coming a mile away? You know, I think so. I, I, Lugo? I think he fits into that group. Like we talked about some pitchers. People were worried about crashing back to earth. And I do think a lot of times you get less for a player like Lugo than you do for the, the example we had was Carlos Rodon, Carlos Rodon. If you're worried about him crashing back to earth, his, there's still someone in your league that sees an ace. That's, kind of the difference. I don't think and anybody in your league sees an ace yeah, yeah. when they look at Seth Lugo. The other end of this board, if you flip it upside down, the underperformers, that's where I think people tend to shop a lot. And the, the extreme, the most extreme one, AJ Puck, three and a half runs uh, worse than his projected. Don't ERA buy. The season. Don't buy. Don't buy there. Uh, <laughs> there's a few, like David Bednar as a closer. I think David Bednar is going to be fine. Uh, if you go a little further down, like Edwin Diaz, I think we maybe we've lowered expectations from best closer in the league, but to like still a tier one closer, I think he'd be someone I'd go I after. So. But I mean, he's still str- like as as much as he's had some issues, like he's still striking out thirty five percent of the batters he sees, and mm-hmm. you know it looks a little bit like the bad year that he had in twenty nineteen, but uh, that's just a, sometimes can be a trick of the sample. Like he could be fairly vintage he could be 2021 uh edwin diaz from here on out three four five era 105 whip 35 percent strikeout rate like that really that loves right in line what he's doing and he'll still end the year with like a, a four one era or something and you know um people will remember it badly but you know going forward i still see him as a guy with a, a sub three era um and, and he has a strikeout rate to to support it Hunter Brown would pop on a list like this projected for a 398. He's run a 639 to the end of May, but he's doing it already. He's starting to turn things back around. He's thrown a sinker now, and he's becoming more of a three fastball guy. Um, and he's just not throwing the, the four scene that was getting spanked. It's like, mm-hmm. he's, here's the pitch that's getting spanked. Let's stop throwing it. So there's a little bit of a, a chance for him because he still has a plus curve and he still has a really good hard slider. So, you know, there's the, which you could use as a cutter. So you, you've already got the the sort of three fastball package here and it'd be kind of more power than most three fastball people have. So there's, there's still a chance for Hunter Brown. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm picking him up and stashing him in certain places where I can, if it's, I don't know if I want to like trade for him. I think I might. I think if I, we had a question we'll answer in, in greater detail in the future is basically how do you build a pitching staff in Dynasty? I think it's a willingness to trade for guys like Hunter Brown when things don't look good. Mm-hmm. Because the people contending need quality innings right now and they may not be willing to ride out the storm. And there's always risk when you're trading for pitching that they'll blow out an elbow or a shoulder and then you're just waiting forever for them to come back. But if you are going to trade for pitching and you're able to get a discount, it's a guy that's already in the big leagues that's shown skills like that, that's showing the ability to make some adjustments. I think that's kind of what I'm looking for in a broader sense. I still can't believe Brown's rostered in just 55% of CBS leagues when he's had this stretch of six starts with a 36 to 11 strikeout to walk. Uh, it's in 32 innings. I, other than a home run problem, it really seems like it's working a lot better for him. And I think his job security also ticked up with the unfortunate news that Christian Javier is having Tommy John surgery. Because as it stands right now, Ronel Blanco, Hunter Brown, and Spencer Aragetti are all pretty safely in the back of that Houston rotation until there's a reason to make a change or a greater reason to make a change. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's get to some project prospect talk and it kind of connects nicely one of the names that you would 
would think about is AJ Bluba. He would probably be the next guy up if they're going to go to a prospect in Houston. We mentioned Eric Lauer, I think a week or so ago as someone who's in the organization now, but I'm not really interested in Eric Lauer at all. Blue has been going a little bit shorter than the major league starters. That might be in an effort to keep some innings available for the end of the season. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, like when you start looking for that next wave of pitchers coming up, it's going to be kind of like Adam Mazur who came up earlier this week to take a spot in the Padres rotation. Maybe Joey Cantillo who just came off the IL uh, AAA for the guardians. Other, other than the occasional like big name promotion, right? We may see Cade Horton in the second half. He's slowed by a, a scub scapular strain right now. So he's out for at least a month. And Jackson Job still kind of working his way back. It's a lot of guys that are not quite top 100 prospects, but they're not bad. They're just like fighting for their chance. Yeah. And they like they're going to all have flaws. Like Adam Mazur's fastball is not good, but. It has okay velo, and he has pretty good command of it, and he throws it high in the zone, and he throws his breaking low in the zone. So it's, he's got an approach, and I think that Mazur is going to have some use um, in certain matchups, but he, he he's a little bit more dependent on the health of the other Padres, right? Um, I, he's not in that rotation when everyone's healthy. Blue ball is like maybe closer because you're talking about Aragetti and Brown being the bottom of that rotation. One more injury, they need another guy. Um, and Aragetti and Brown could still play themselves out of the rotation. Yeah. Um, all the range ball, outcomes. Blue ball has the same flaw as Mazur. He does not necessarily have the same strength in the fastball command, but uh, his four seam fastball had a 73 stuff plus in the minor leagues uh, in AAA this year. Um, he has a good sweeper, a good slider, uh, a 76 stuff plus cutter, but cutters can be tricky. Maybe, maybe the model's missing something there. Um, a good curveball he doesn't throw very often, um, and a, a changeup that he commands really well. So it's a really robust uh, group of pitches. Uh, it's only one fastball or two, with it, depending on the cutter, the cutter's velo. Um, but he can mix it up, you know? And so I, I, I would be careful with necessarily throwing him the first time he gets the, you know, a start at start the big leagues, but um, getting a, a sense of like how he uses his pitches. That's why I definitely wanted to watch Mazer. Um, you know, another, another name that is coming up um, and uh, that we have some minor league numbers on is that Cade Povich. Mm-hmm is starting today for the uh, Baltimore Orioles. And uh, again, if they had great fastballs, they'd be in the big leagues already. (laughs) So Kate Povich, as much as this might surprise you with the strikeout rates that he's got, uh, has an 82 stuff plus on the fastball with a 102 location plus. So he might have enough command of that fastball to get past some of the shape issues. Uh, He's got a an above average cutter, uh, a strong sweeper, uh, a pretty good curveball, and the the model does not like the changeup. Overall, it gives ninety stuff plus to Cade Povich, which I think if if people are going nuts and going to put a lot of money on him, I would go the other direction. Uh, but it is a good enough, wide enough mix again, like Blue Bond, like Mazer, where uh, they've caught my attention, and you know. Players like this, I, I hesitate. I don't want to use the word like beat the model, but like players like this could be useful in matchups that you don't expect. You know, if they can put up a 93 or 92 stuff plus with good locations, then that's that that puts them in the blob of useful pitchers, depending on who they're playing. I'm not going to throw any of these guys against the Yankees in Yankee Stadium, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, right. I mean, but there's a lot of guys that don't make the cut for that. So yeah, right. I think that's <laughs> that's okay. It's it's what are you replacing? It actually, in a lot of ways, Cade Povich's resume has reminded me of Robert Gasser's resume mm. like from this time last year, where you're getting good results at the highest level of the minor leagues. A lot of it comes back to home park, organizational trust, game planning, defense. The Orioles tick a lot of those boxes. The Orioles have become an organization that we can trust a lot more with players like this. So I'm typically more in on someone like Povich than uh, than I might be if I was just chasing high, high ceilings, because I think he could end up being 
at least average for ratios, maybe above average for wins and average or better in Ks if you use them correctly. I think that's but, all possible. You know, a corollary to our ongoing conversation of why some minor league uh, strikeout rates don't port over for hitters is uh, why they don't port over for pitchers because Robert Gasser was working on 30% strikeout rates all the way through the minor leagues. I think if just eyeballing it, it's over 30 for the minor leagues. And he's got a 14% strikeout rate in the major leagues. Um, and uh, I could see Povich doing the same thing because uh, most recently he's been on the 30s. Um, but the swing strike rate's not amazing. And the stuff plus isn't, isn't amazing. There are still, you know, Gasser's been very useful. Uh, I've, I've liked him. But somebody asked me, for example, should I start, you say Kikuchi or Cade Povich today? And I was mm. like, this is very easily you say Kikuchi for me. Yeah, you want to take. I mean, I guess Baltimore's a better lineup, trust. but Kikuchi's just a better pitcher. Kikuchi's shown that improvement over more than one season now, too. I think yeah. we've, we've found a, kind of a new baseline for him that it's much easier to trust, even in above average matchups. That would never have been the case for him you know, two or three years ago. I think he would have been someone you'd have used a lot more carefully than you do now. Um, the other prospect news to pass along, River Ryan has started his rehab assignment. I think that's a little bit interesting just because we've seen a wide range of, of evaluations on River Ryan uh, across the scouting community, but also because of the issues we were pointing at earlier in the show with the Dodgers rotation, right? This is a group of pitchers that just isn't quite as tight depth-wise as it has been in recent years. So he could be the next guy up for an opportunity in the second half of the season, if everything goes okay with his rehab assignment. Yeah. I mean, I guess losing Emmett Sheehan for the year, um, you know, they're, they're taking a little bit of a hit on the, you know, we can fix veterans thing in, in, in LA because, you know, Noah Syndergaard, James Paxton, and there's there, the rule of three is there's one more, but I forget his name. They hit him um, Andrew Heaney. Andrew Heaney, yeah. Like uh, I guess that was that was the success story. And they hit on Tyler Anderson too. That's right. They, That's they right. hit on some. It, it's almost I, with Cindergard and Paxton, you can give them the injury excuse in some ways. Like those guys were not completely. And, and Paxton, you thought like you know, uh, you thought with James Paxton, you thought that um, you know he had the fastball velo. And won't the, you know, won't the slider velo, uh, you know, just come back? And uh, this year, both the fastball velo has not stayed where it was last year. And the slider, the cutter velo has gotten worse. So when Capax was at his best, he had an 88 to 89 mile an hour cutter. Right now he's at 84. Hmm. Um, and, and I guess, you know, you can take the bet as the Dodgers that, hey, he's throwing 95. Why can't he throw the cutter 87? You know, um, you can take that bet and sometimes you just lose it. But you didn't put that much on the line. And he's in that class of the like Corey Kluber near the end of his career where he kept taking one year, $10 million deals or whatever. You know, that's that's what everyone's trying to do for their number five. And they're hoping that, oh, if James Paxson doesn't work out, Emmett Sheehan will take his job. Well, Emmett Sheehan got hurt. Bobby Miller got hurt. So you're happy to have the kind of lower ceiling Gavin Stone that you mix in there. Um, but I'm a little bit pessimistic that Clayton Kershaw will pitch this year, given timelines for his injury. I know that he's playing catch and he even threw a live batting practice, but we're not really going to get velo numbers out of these live batting practices. Um, so until I know that he's throwing over 87, um, I'm not like fully in on Kershaw, which means there's kind of an opening there for Landon Knack, who's who's done it. Um, but if River Ryan outperforms Landon Knack, he could be the next guy up. Yeah, he kind of lands in that bucket. That's exactly where he, he would go is kind of alongside Landon Knack as their next options up for a promotion. Uh, we talked about the Guardians a few weeks ago when we were looking at the AL Central and how they didn't necessarily have the same sort of cupboard pitching-wise if they were to lose members of their big league rotation. But Joey Cantillo now is healthy at AAA. I know he spent a lot of time there last year. I think it was 20 appearances, 95 innings, over a strikeout per inning. I had a bit of a home run problem and a walk problem. 
I'm curious if you have any model numbers handy on, on Joey Cantillo to see if he falls into the Povich Gasser minor league prospect blob where we're we're interested, but we're not also, also like shattering a, a fab piggy bank at the time of his eventual promotion once an opportunity opens up or if an opportunity opens up for Joey Cantillo. Yeah, and the old uh, Google Doc from last year, I've got uh, the final uh, AAA numbers from uh, last season. And he had a 102.5 uh, stuff plus down there. Um, and uh, I think a viable mix. He did have poor location plus in the minor leagues. And that fits with your kind of um, back of the napkin work that you were just doing. Uh, you can also just see it in the walk rates, 18, 20%, 12%. So what I want to see from Cantillo going forward is to get that walk rate down to, you know, 10, 11% at least, um, make him more of a viable pitcher from a command standpoint. And, uh, and I think he is somebody that I care about uh, because it is, I think, a good changeup, if I remember correctly. Um, and a good enough fastball that, you know, and yeah, w like what is the Guardians rotation right now? Um, who's at the back end of it that you've got Carrasco sort of falling out and Gavin Williams just not not getting good news. He did uh, pitch a rehab yesterday. start going. Yeah, he's he's two making a little innings. progress. So maybe another two ish weeks and he'll be stretched out enough to come back. We feel a little bit like Ben Lively could uh, pumpkin at any time. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not the biggest uh, Xavion Curry fan. Um, and so you would really just say like healthy, you know, everyone healthy, Bobby McKenzie are the one and two. Probably Logan Allen has done enough to be the three. Uh, and then the four and five can be anyone from Lively, Williams, um, and Cantillo. So if the, if the lively train goes off the rails uh, at the time that Cantillo is getting right, there could be a swap there. I, it's not um, guaranteed, but uh, what you put, you'd put Cantillo like sort of seventh on the depth chart right now. Yeah. And those are the pitchers we're watching closely because they might be the pickups of the future. August and, and July. Yeah. Might not be that far away. Speaking of pickups, let's take a look at some players we're going to be looking at on the wire this weekend. It's a lot of scrap heap bats. We'll start on that side, unless you're going after some of the guys that got promoted earlier in the week. That would be either Connor Norby or Justin Henry Malloy. Shout out yeah. to Justin Henry Malloy for that first MLB homer. I mean, the thing that's happening here, that homer broke up a perfect game bid from Jose mm -hmm. Urania, by the way. But Three consecutive starts as the DH, hitting sixth or seventh for the Tigers to begin his career. Three Ks in his first 10 plate appearances. Those are the things we're looking at. Like, how much is he playing? Is he doing anything other than DHing? And how much is he striking out? There's enough ways they can shift other players around in their lineup that he can hit his way into a permanent role. That is possible, possible for Justin Henry Malloy. It's having guys like Wenseal Perez or even Zach McKinstry, some of the guys that either play multiple spots or are almost regulars, having those guys underperform would create a spot or a need for a hitter like Malloy to just stick and then they would move guys around. They'd play Riley Green in center field more if they had to or just make adjustments like that because they do have some defensive versatility. It's a lot like what we saw in San Francisco. Not a surprise since that's the organization that Scott Harris was was hired from. And, but that's kind of a good thing for a positionless player if that player hits enough. It's just the threshold, as we mentioned before, it's really high. So is Malloy, is he even on your radar in leagues that have fewer than 15 teams right now, even though he's getting regular run? The interesting thing is when he did play in the position, a position it was the right field. And I just checked really quickly, and Mark Canna is the, is the first baseman now. Um, and I guess that makes sense because Mark Hanna is only under contract um, until the end of this year. And, um, you know, if you're going to, like, you, you're going to, what you'll do with Canna is like, while you're still playing for this year, you play him, you know? And if at some point the worm turns and you say, okay, we're playing for next year, then you call up Torkelson and you, kind of devalue Mark Hanna's playing time because he won't be with your team the next year. Maybe even mm -hmm. trade him away. Right? 
Um, so Canna replaces Torgelson. That means the outfield is Riley Green, Wensfield Perez, and Matt Veerling, who's playing third. Plays third, third and center. Like he's Veerling. Urshela is playing some third. Yeah, Urshela, I think, mostly plays against lefties. They they just move dudes around a lot. Uh, he is battling, I guess it's kind of, yeah, Urshela. I, I think it's just hit enough. Either either hit and you play because we need we need a Hitter. bat, or if you don't hit, you're we'll just send you back down. That's I think it's that simple. I think it just rides mostly on Malloy. Kerry Carpenter has a lumbar spine stress fracture. Right, and there's your guy who's off the roster other than Torkelson that has left the, another path to playing time open for someone else. Right? Do you have That's, a more recent update or a knowledge of this his? Uh, of Kerry Carpenter's timeline because that sounds pretty bad. It sounds pretty bad, and it was previously just inflammation. So the follow-up diagnosis that it was a stress fracture is worse. I don't get the sense that that's a fast injury to recover from. And even if he came back quickly, would you be the same player right away? Couple of months, they said. Yeah. So that's more like post trade deadline, right? A couple of months puts us in early August. Yeah. So I guess if you're watching the box scores, watch uh, Gio Urshela, watch Matt Vierling, watch Wenzel Perez. That's the that's the group that Malloy is is trying to snipe somebody off of. I guess the other thing you could talk yourself into is if the Tigers are a team that moves veterans like Canha at the deadline. They want to give Malloy a look. Deadline. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look. He could kind of glue the injury opportunity to the post trade deadline opportunity. <laughs> and this could be an extended look for him. Like, is he a, a core piece for your lineup or not? Like, that's the question the Tigers kind of have to answer around trying to be a contending team for this year. As far as Norby goes, he has started two or three games for the Orioles, both at second base. He was on the bench against the righty on Wednesday, a couple of strikeouts and seven plate appearances, but I don't know why I don't trust his playing time. It's just it's, like I said, it's that that it, it's a fungible roster spot for them and it could be anything. It could be Jackson Holiday against him. It could be him, it could be Mayo, Mateo yeah. could come off the concussion IL. It, we've already seen him do it with Curse Dad. Like there's just things do change if there's like if you see Cedric Mullins DFA news, like sure. That's the kind of thing you would need to feel more confident in pretty much any of those young guys that are trying to carve out a role right now with the Orioles. Um, the other guys that are more scrap heap in nature, the most interesting bat that is still pretty low rostered, at least in CBS leagues, is Jose Miranda. He's looking more like the guy he was in 2022 again, rostered about 15% of those leagues, and he started every game for the Twins dating back to May 17th. So he's Got that everyday run of playing time. It's kind of like you talked about earlier with Corey Jokes, where, but yeah, maybe there's some flaws, but he's playing right now. It might not last because of all the competition. We talked about Edward Julian getting sent down earlier. Well, in the, the week, big one is he was playing third, and Royce Lewis is back, and Royce Lewis is back to put some extra pressure on. So now he's too. playing uh, since Royce Lewis has been back. He's played first and DH. I mean, I guess the good news is he still played. Mm -hmm. You know, the, he wasn't the corresponding move uh, for Royce Lewis coming back. And you've got Carl Santana playing to this really weird, okay level. 99 WRC plus for Carlos Santana with a projection from the bad X for 97. That's not good enough for first base. And I don't know. I guess the, he's a good defender, though. So, and the thing is, though, you've got Miranda, Kirloff, and Santana, and Buxton, and Larnack for first base and DH. I think that's why he's low rostered. Miranda, yeah, still concerned about the playing time, but it's playing more than people expected. We'll see if it holds through the weekend now that Lewis is back. Jack Sawinski's back up in the big leagues. If that does anything for anybody, uh, that was a that was a that was an injury swap out. I was going to say, it was a pretty quick demotion. It's like, could he have fixed anything in that brief time? Down Wasn't in the it an injury swap out? Somebody got hurt hmm. for the Pirates. I know there was a corresponding move that made it make sense. Is Taylor hurt? Taylor's on the paternity list. Right. Is that it? It's just a temporary run for that? 
Yeah, and then there's another. There's G G one Bay went on the IL. Let's that's it. it. That's what that Bay's is. on the IL and Taylor's on. And so like, that's a really intense kind of short term need because nobody else can play center. Mm. Now, how long does Bay go on the IL? Uh, does make a difference for how much? Uh, it's a sprained right wrist. I mean, that could be a couple weeks. Um, so you could get one more week out of Sawinski. Um, we've already, we've already talked about how I, I do think there's a bat in there, but I would be very conservative with him considering that he may just lose his job as soon as Taylor and Bay are back. Um, and, and so I don't know about that one. There is a name here that I've been interested in, um, since the beginning, since spring really is blaze Alexander. Mm. Um, and I don't know why I like him. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so a 398 bab, it makes me think he can just hit, but you know, like a 110.6 max EV, um, uh, not really too many grounders. Like the swing strike rate is pretty good. He has better walk rates in the minors. Like he actually just looks like kind of a, a hitterish guy. And at 24, coming in kind of close to his peak, like it seems kind of polished. And one thing I don't like is they keep playing him at DH, which means that they don't think much of his defensive ability. It's a really weird thing. So he's the last four starts, second base, third base, shortstop, DH. And then second base and third base yesterday. It's they a caught a really lot of lefties. Name. They cut a lot of lefties in a small amount of time, though, in Arizona. I think that might have been was driving up the Blaze Alexander playing time. In San Francisco, though, just Kyle Harrison, right? I forget where they were before that. I saw the it was like four out of their last five games were against left-handed starters. Wow. Yeah, that does that does uh change things a little bit. Let me see if I can just check from the schedule really quickly. Um Jordan Hicks is a righty, Kyle Harrison, Eric Miller was the starter in the other Giants game, but he's he was a... Um, that's an opener. That's yeah. an opener. They did have Jose Quintana and Sean Manaya in the Mets. Yeah. Um, but he started uh, against an opener, and he started against a righty. Um, so what you, you could read the tea leaves here a little bit. What is the team context for him? Uh, you got Cattell Marte is the starter at second. Eugenio Suarez is the starter at third and he's not doing well could suarez lose his job possible we've talked about him a few times now where he's the kind of player at the stage of his career if it all collapses suddenly he's a part-time guy or a dfa candidate right that could be something that would happen more in the trade deadline window i think it's less likely to happen right now because they still fancy themselves contenders for this year and probably see but blaze kind of could eat there. away at his job um you know you've got Cattell Marte uh, plays a dh sometimes yeah. right so i mean what you've got in blaze is he's going to start against righties and basically what he is is in a platoon with jock peterson however he has enough defensive versatility that what you can say is i've got the starting against righties as the foundation and then i've got the giving suarez or Marte a rest hmm as the secondary foundation because that's where he's, he plays second and third i mean i guess he's also played short but i don't the way that they use him is he's not a candidate to take perdomo's job it doesn't seem like they want to play him at shortstop a lot no it's complicated even further by jordan lawler eventually being healthy and maybe to be an option to play in this infield as well so that's sort of the longer term concern i would take Alexander. i would take him as a bat streamer in in leagues if I saw some lefties on the schedule and was like, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of faith cast him into another game on top of the lefties. I see, you know what I mean? Sure. No, like I think if he has sense. three lefties next week, you could be like, you know what? Three lefties plus two other starts. He gets five starts. I'm going to put like two bucks on him. You know what I mean? I mean, I, it, the, the, I have him in my 20 team weekly. Um, uh, and we haven't been starting him, even though I look at him every week and say, should I start him this week? It's always on your mind. Uh, <laughs> Emmanuel Van Valdez getting a chance with all the injuries in Boston right now is kind of the second base, uh, occasional DH option. I think well, he Grissom also went on the IL with like a uh, hamstring again. Oh, okay. Same same stuff he was dealing with in the spring. Four it feels like it wasn't games. as bad as spring training, but he's getting imaging today. 
yeah, I, I, I always feel like it's worse the second time. Just you're you're probably not coming back in less time unless you're just being really, really careful. I don't know. Uh, we have one, uh, uh, Josh Lowe. Yeah. You know, kind of re-aggravated the oblique and then and then got back out there really quickly. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, these, you know, he what he, he's isn't he the guy who hits the ball hard but uh, strikes out a lot? Yeah, he's 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 one of those guys where this this might be his best chance. He's twenty five. Mm. He's put up interesting numbers in the minors. I don't oh, know. Poor if batting it, averages in the minors, like yeah, not necessarily like a good defender anywhere either. So just has a has to hit a lot to sort of change the. The outlook he kind of yeah. reminds me of like the the bad side of um an ezekiel duran package mm. Mm. it's not that's not that exciting um shifting the focus over to some pitchers here real quick i'm a little surprised tyler mcgill only 45 percent rostered in cbs league seems like he should be pushing his way onto more shadow league rosters in the immediate future his velo is trending in the right direction and he's yeah, he, he's a lot better when he's throwing harder and it's a good home park no win for him if he pitches well uh i think most games i i think he should be owned near universally not necessarily started universally no definitely in that sort of you know be careful like would i start him in citizens bank no no but I'd start in most places. I think that's where I'm at with Tyler McGill right now. Uh, Albert Suarez, the other Orioles pitcher, getting some run with all the injuries they're dealing with. Dean Kramer's down with a tricep strain. Tyler Wells had another UCL surgery, and John Means had a second Tommy John. So Wait, similar. Wells had surgery? Yeah, it was a UCL surgery. They didn't specify it was Tommy John brace or, or what it was, but Wells is also now out. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I yeah, like there's Suarez. Got this I mean, so now Povich and Suarez, uh, like Irvin is basically, if Irvin's available, Irvin's basically in the rotation now. I, He's over his skis, Cole Irvin. Sure. I mean, it's a 15% strikeout rate and a and a 2.8 DRA. So I'd be careful, very careful about using Cole Irvin. But I'd have Coven. I have Irvin. I think ahead of Suarez and maybe even Povich. Um, but Povich is a little bit more of a could could surprise, and there could be better numbers in there. Like you know, one thing that happens too is there is definitely a thing where people in the minors are not throwing their best fastballs hmm. um, because they can get along without it. And we know there's something called the debut bump. We know that when they get to the big leagues, they throw harder. So Povich's fastball could play better once he gets to the big leagues and throws harder. So um, that's that's the back end of that rotation. But right now they need pretty much all of them um, because you kind of, in today's league, kind of need six starters on your roster. Yeah, I think that's you know being careful with Bradish this week is what opened the door for Povich in the first place. I started to get excited about Suarez a little bit this spring, but he's got a tough two step this week. He's got Atlanta and Philly both at home. I don't want that. I and I'd really also be really that. careful with. Um, I've noticed this two steps with guys like Suarez, where you know two steps with a fourth starter. I believe much more than the you know than the fifth start. It's like. They could do anything to change. Anything it. could happen. Yeah. 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 Povich could stay up. So I was, you know, like, you know, whatever. So um, I, I don't, I don't trust them that much. It's a good, it's a, it's a pretty good fastball, but the secondaries aren't that great. And, um, you know, y y if you don't have both of those things, it's kind of, he doesn't have the strikeouts. So. Uh, last name I want to throw out there for this episode, uh, Hurston Waldrip, once again on the radar, an 11 strikeout game at AAA earlier this week. It was his only second career start at the level. He made one there last year, but uh, Spencer Schwellenbach got dinged up by the Red Sox pretty good. So that's sort of an ongoing job battle to keep an eye on. And Waldrip's been a lot better since his first two starts at the beginning of the year at AA. He had a seven run in two and two thirds inning uh, performance to start the year at Pensacola. He's been pitching very, very well since then at both of those stops. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in, in Waldrop. I think that you know what the Braves are doing is kind of running through the options um, and, and trying to see who's going to stick because they're pretty well set with Freed, uh, Salen, Morton, and Lopez at the top. They may have to give Lopez a breather at some point for innings, 
Um, and basically they're running through all these guys uh, in the fifth starter role uh, to see who can be better than Bryce Elder, basically, who can be better, who can be good enough to kind of take that, take that and run with it. So I think that's pretty much an open role that's just waiting for the right person to fill it. I, there's some things I like about Schwellenbach, but it turns out that the, the two, um, the two strengths that he has, the fastball and slider, are offset by his other pitches not being quite as good. Um, and so Shaver has been like pretty remarkably up and down with the stuff. Um, I don't know what it is, if the velo is going yo-yoing or something, but um, Smith Shaver has, has looked good and bad at times in the numbers. Uh, so that leaves the door open for Waldrop. Yeah, and Smith Shelfer down right now at that grade two oblique strain too. So that's going to take probably six to eight weeks or so for him to get back. That's the other thing that leaves. They're the hoping, I longer. think, that one of these guys, um, they, they almost want to time it where one of these guys comes on in September and is healthy and is pitching their best and is their kind of little October surprise thing where they're like, oh, and you haven't seen this guy 10 times this year, you know? Sure feels like that. Uh, we are going to go on our way out the door. A reminder, get a subscription to The Athletic at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek and Riper. Join the Discord. We got the link in the show description. Be sure to smash the like button on this video, especially if you made it all the way to the end. We really appreciate that. We are back with you at 1 o'clock Eastern on our YouTube channel on Friday. Thanks for listening.